Welcome everyone. And thank you so much for, uh, welcome to the 2022 National Ryan White Conference and HIV Care and Treatment Session, Community Engagement Institute 201, the impact of the stories we tell. My name is Amy Schrapp and I'm the, the Senior Health Communication Specialist within HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau Office of Program Support, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Today, you'll be from a, a presentation from a panel of incredible speakers on this really important topic. And first, you'll hear from our panel moderator, Valerie Gallo. Valerie Gallo is the Deputy Regional Administrator for HRSA's Region 9 Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs in San Francisco, California. Through her work with, at IEA, Valerie collaborates with stakeholders to increase the reach, impact, and recognition of HRSA's programs through on-the-ground outreach, education, technical assistance, and partnership development. We thank you so much for joining today's session. As you participate in the session, please feel free to add your questions and comments into the chat box. At the conclusion of the session's the presentation, the presenters will have the opportunity to answer your questions. So let's begin. My name is Valerie Gallo, and I am the Deputy Regional Administrator at the Health Resources and Services Administration San Francisco Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. On behalf of HRSA, I'd like to welcome you to our session, Community Engagement, the Impact of the Stories We Tell. Community engagement often begins with sharing the stories of lived experience from people with HIV, their families, and community partners. In fact, HRSA's Ryan White HIV AIDS program was established in the United States over 30 years ago because of the stories of many Americans facing HIV and AIDS. The program was named after a young man, Ryan White, whose story was shared widely and touched many. The role of community engagement is also at the center of discussion surrounding the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the United States initiative. Two years ago, many of the storytellers in today's group planned to present a similar symposium at the AIDS 2020 conference. I was so excited to welcome the group to my city of San Francisco, where the conference was scheduled to be held. But then COVID-19 took hold and we had to pivot to doing everything including our presentation online. Truthfully, I don't think any of us thought we'd be on our third summer trying to navigate and avoid COVID, but here we are, and this is why we're still doing a remote conference. During this time, we've all learned a lot about the need to be flexible, offering each other lots of grace while we navigated the new normal, and most importantly, how much we really do need human engagement in our communities, whether that was a small pod of trusted friends or an online support group. It is important for our stories to be shared and heard by others. This session will stimulate deeper thinking on what community engagement is, what it can mean, and how it can spark innovation, starting with the stories that we tell. Before I turn it over to our storytellers, I'd like to tell you a bit more about HRSA and share a few housekeeping details. At the conclusion of our session, participants will be able to learn how storytelling can change decision makers' minds about programs and even policy, understand effective strategy, used by the Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients to make system changes that are responsive to community needs and learn what can be gained by both sharing and listening to the stories of the people that are served in the Ryan White program. It should also be noted that none of our presenters have any financial interest to disclose. Now let's talk about HRSA. We support more than 90 programs through grants and cooperative agreements to more than 3,000 awardees, including community and faith-based organizations colleges and universities, hospitals, state, local, and tribal governments, as well as private entities. And every year, HRSA programs serve tens of millions of people, including people living with HIV and AIDS, pregnant women, mothers and their families, and those otherwise unable to access quality health care. As I mentioned, I'm with HRSA's Region 9 Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. And our mission is to provide on-the-ground outreach to increase the reach impact and awareness of HRSA programs, which is what I'm doing today. In addition to representing IAA, I'm also representing HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau, or simply known as HAB. Given the rapid changes in healthcare and the ending the HIV epidemic in the United States initiative, along with the release of the National HIV AIDS Strategy, we have refreshed HAB's vision and mission. This update ensures that both our mission and vision are forward-looking and acknowledges the ultimate goal of ending the HIV epidemic in the United States. Also acknowledges what HAB needs to do to get there while continuing to provide the quality HIV care 
of the Ryan White program that current and newly diagnosed people with HIV need. We want to underscore that we wouldn't be able to achieve our vision and mission without the support of all of you who are carrying out this important work each day. The Ryan White program provides a comprehensive system of HIV primary medical care, medications, and essential support services for low-income people with HIV. The program funds grants to states, cities, counties, and local community-based organizations to improve health outcomes and reduce HIV transmission. And it's important to note that recipients determine service delivery and funding priorities based on the local needs and planning process. The Ryan White program has also provided services to nearly 562,000 people in 2020, and that's more than half of all people with diagnosed HIV in the United States. Nearly 90% of Ryan White clients receiving HIV medical care were virally suppressed in 2020, which exceeds the national average of 64.6%. The voices of people with HIV, their communities, and the greater communities that support people with HIV have been the cornerstone of the HRSA Ryan White HIV AIDS program since its passage by Congress in 1990. And while the Ryan White program has successfully provided care, support, and treatment for more than 560,000 people with HIV in 2020, there remain, remains hundreds of thousands of people who have HIV who are not diagnosed or are inconsistently in care. With a renewed focus on community engagement to meet the goals for ending the HIV epidemic in the United States, our collective success depends on how well communities are involved in the planning, development, and implementation of HIV care and treatment strategies. As you will see on this slide, the road to defining what community engagement means was never simple. The visual here illustrates where we started with our conversation to establish a framework around what community engagement means. This was our first visual developed in the fall of 2020 by a member of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program community. Our community has been incredibly influential in the process to help have define what is community engagement. And most importantly, we must note that there is no singular definition for community engagement. Instead, HAB has worked to come up with some guiding principles around our framework, which you will see on the next slide. These five guiding principles uh, are intentional. Ryan White recipients and subrecipients plan thoughtfully how to effectively partner with people with HIV and other communities, building on existing strengths that exist in these communities. We are committed. Authentic community engagement means investing in the development of people with HIV and facilitating their access to tools needed to partner and participate effectively. Sustainable, to meet the goals of ending the HIV epidemic and ensuring that community engagement continually builds and grows, it is important to establish and maintain sustainable strategies should be flexible and tailored. Developing innovative strategy for community engagement and input that is broad and allows for flexibility that acknowledges the required time and process for leadership development. Recipients and subrecipients are supported to develop creative strategies that are flexible in order to meet people where they are. And finally, transformational. Community engagement is an iterative process that includes ongoing communication and feedback between recipients and subrecipients, providers, community-based organizations, and people with HIV. This shared experience centers on the needs of people with HIV and results in transformative approach needed to support engagement and care and achieve the goals of ending the HIV epidemic. And now I have the pleasure of introducing you to our storytellers. Antigone Dempsey is a special advisor to HRSA's administrator. She also spent over eight years as a division director for policy and data at HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau in Rockville, Maryland. Leandro Rodriguez Ramos is the vice president of programs for the Latino Commission on AIDS in New York City. Jacqueline Bickham is the prevention program manager at the Louisiana Department of Health, Office of Public Health, STD HIV hepatitis program. Vince Chris Sostomo is currently the director of aging services at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Additionally, he sits on the San Francisco Human Rights Commission, LGBTQI plus advisory committee, the San Francisco mayor's long-term care coordinating council and the California state equity and aging committee. And finally, Dr. Celeste Watkins Hayes is a university diversity and social transformation professor, the Jean Fairfax collegiate professor of public policy professor of sociology at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. 
She is also the founding director of the Center for Racial Justice and currently serves as the interim dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I am thrilled for you all to hear the story shared during our session today. We hope this will advance the ongoing discussions on how to ensure that the voices of people with lived experience help guide the way towards ending the HIV epidemic. Antigone, the floor is yours. First of all, I just want to say um, that I'm just so thrilled to be on this panel uh, with uh, my fellow colleagues um, and to be able to participate in, in this discussion about storytelling. This has been something that's been extremely important for me throughout my career. Um, and, uh, and I just have so much respect for everyone. And Valerie, thank you for all of your support for this panel. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of storytelling on my career, my life. Um, and uh, just to really tie into some of the principles that, that Valerie talked about earlier, um, I was able to be one of the leaders to help develop those community engagement principles in the HIV AIDS Bureau. So a lot of what came out of that was definitely guided through a lot of my experience. Um, so for me, um, storytelling in HIV started uh, with my diagnosis. I was diagnosed with HIV in 1990 as a young woman. I was 22 years old. Um, and at the time, there were very few women being diagnosed with HIV or, or really people talking about it. I think women were being diagnosed, um, but it just, for me, was a huge shock. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, I'd asked doctors about my risk for HIV, and I always, you know, sort of got, oh, you're fine. You're not at risk um, because there, you know, there was a lot of discussion about HIV it was, was happening in, um, with gay men. And, um, but it was happening, as we know, in many other communities as well. So when I was diagnosed, there was no treatment. Um, I was told that I had six months to live. I was given a chart and it basically showed HIV to um, AIDS and death. And that chart had six months on it. I was given that. And then I was given a pamphlet for support group for young people with HIV. And then they sent me on my way. Um, and. Uh, you know, luckily I had a very supportive mother who was with me and family, um, but I went to that support group that following Monday and I was terrified. I, you know, I mean, at that time being diagnosed with HIV was a death sentence and it was a death sentence, but I showed up in that support group and I got to hear this. And this is really for me where it started, the stories of other young people and people that looked like me and people that didn't look like me but sharing their experience living with HIV. And some, some of them were very sick. Um, and it was the first time I had been exposed to people um, dying from AIDS. Um, it was also the first time I had uh, been in a room with a whole group of people with HIV. For me though, hearing those stories and being able to connect, that just gave me some hope because I just felt so alone and so afraid. So the other piece, you know, I think this still happens today when I was diagnosed, I felt so much shame and stigma and, you know, what did I do wrong? Nobody's going to, to love me. I'll never be able to have a family. No one's going to want me. No one's going to want to be friends with me. Um, and I started to learn how to tell my story. And the way that I was able to do that was through the support group and also the leaders of that group who were uh, a social worker and a therapist. They invested in me and other people uh, to learn how to both like lead that group, but also tell our stories. I needed to be able to get out there and tell my story for me because I was felt so overwhelmed by the thought of people telling my story without me being able to tell it that I just went out and told everybody. So I, you know, and I don't know if I'd recommend that either. <laughs> I did not think through it. I was sort of everywhere. And one of the things um that I did was I, I uh, went back to uh, through a program in San Francisco called the Wedge Program and you'll hear from Vince later Vince and I would go in together and tell our stories to middle school and high school students so I went back to my middle school I went back to my high school and I shared my experience you know testing positive and being diagnosed with HIV and they always sent a man and a woman together and diverse groups and I just think that was just so that was another sort of way for me to be able to try to make a difference. I just didn't want this to happen to other people in the way it had happened to me. And so it gave me, felt me some power to be able to sort of address that. The other thing that that did for me was we also began to advocate. And so I was able to be able to show up at different tables and talk about the needs of young people with HIV at the time. And I was invited to different policy tables. And honestly, 
I barely understood, I think, at the beginning what people were talking about, but as I continued to be able to be at those tables and participate, and then I'll start working in the HIV field, um, then I was able uh, to, uh, uh, I think, um, share in a way that made a difference. And part of, for me, the storytelling was always about not just bringing my voice, but the voices of other people that I was with or working with and being able to um, sort of share all those pieces. So, you know, that transition of being being able to show up at other tables and other, you know, roles sort of brought me to my role um, in the government. And um, that experience has has just been really critical um, because, you know, uh, being able to share my experience or experiences that I know that others have had in, in really key policy discussions at certain times, it's just been really important to be able to bring that perspective. And I, so I felt very uh, uh, I, I have felt empowered by that and supported in the HIV AIDS Bureau to do that. Of course, as we know, those of us living with HIV, you know, our stories are not always a part of the discussion, but sometimes, you know, there's a time when it's like, you know what, I need to share this right now to be able to help people understand what this could mean for people. And I've been able to do that. Um, also for me, throughout the past, you know, 30 years, HIV has changed. So, you know, I've gone through a process also of, uh, I, I have these stories that I've told and these stories about my experiences and, and ways I've explained HIV, but that has changed, you know, with the um, treatment as prevention. So, you know, being virally suppressed, uh, that is such a huge change for me. One experience that I had, I was, um, I've always told my son, I have a 12 year old, but, but he's always known that I've had HIV. And so this way I would always talk about it in the past was, you know, HIV is transmitted through blood and, you know, all this and, and you know, fluids. Um, that was like my training, you know, with Vince. It was, all, you know, and so my son, you know, asked me, we're in a parking lot at a grocery store. He's like, mommy, you have HIV. And I said, yes, yes, you know, I do have HIV. And then he said, can I get HIV from you? And I was like, I went into, you know, well, HIV is transmitted through blood. And then I was like, wait a minute wait, he cannot get HIV from me. I am virally suppressed. And so I was like, no, you cannot get HIV from me at all. <laughs> like, because I'm on treatment and I'm virally suppressed. And, you know, and just for me in that moment, like realizing, wait a minute, I can say something different. And it just felt a huge weight off of my shoulders. So, so that's just another sort of way that storytelling, you know, changes over time and impacts us. So the last thing I want to share is that one of the wonderful opportunities I've had um, working in the HIV AIDS Bureau is to be able to institutionalize this process and make it available, bring it back. So we created a program called the Building Leaders of Color um, Project, where it was investing in leadership training and development of people um, of color living with HIV to not just tell their stories, but to be active participants uh, in the development and training and, um, uh, and evaluation of Brian White program so we can get to where we're trying to get to. And then from that, we, we evolved that to actually um, um, employment leadership, because that's another stage to that. So, you know, so for me, it's kind of all come full circle where um, I've been able to try to help set up some ongoing systems to be able to continue this legacy because I just, it's so critical and important to me. Um, and that's why I'm just so thrilled to be here today and to be on this panel. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to um, be able to hand this over to my good friend and colleague, uh, Leandro Rodriguez. Leandro, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Antigone. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure listening to your story. And, and, and you know, I want to say that I'm very privileged to know you and, and to be your colleague as well in, in this field because stories like yours really do inspire folks and, and certainly have inspired me. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, hello, everyone. Um, the last time that I spoke at this conference, um, I spoke on a story that really impacted me and it was the story of Alexa. Um, Alexa was a transgender um, Puerto Rican Black woman who was um, homeless and going through her own mental health conditions. Um, she was murdered in Puerto Rico, and her murder was live streamed for the world to see um, back in February 2020. And today, her murderers have not been caught, and it seems that the, that the story has disappeared, but it hasn't. Um, there are organizations, friends, allies, and advocates that still demand justice for her. Um, 
but sadly, February 2020 uh, was the introduction of what it felt like one of the darkest moments in, in our century. Um, according to the Forbes uh, magazine, 28 transgender people were killed in 2020. And in 2021, at least 57 transgender and gender non-conforming people were shot or killed. And sadly, to date, in 2022, nearly 30 transgender and non-binary folks have been killed. So it's fair to say that during the past two years, our LGBTQI plus community have been under serious attack. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, forced many LGBTQ youth to shelter and place in environments that were not safe or affirming. Prior to, to the pandemic, the Human Rights Campaign and the Trevor Project through their research warned us that there was going to be an increased risk for depression, anxiety, substance use, and suicidality. Um, as our center oasis in New York City was told to close its doors because of the pandemic and we transitioned to virtual services, we kept hearing from our clients stories of despair and resignation as many of them lost their jobs, lost their social networks and support system, and a lot of them lost loved ones to the pandemic as well. To those most vulnerable, the importance of social support disappeared, jeopardizing their physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And now, as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, our main challenge is to redefine community engagement once again. Still, our most vulnerable are under attack. Um, as as uh, Antigone was saying, there have been great advances uh, made in the HIV prevention and treatment front, but HIV continues to have a disproportionate impact on certain populations, particularly racial and ethnic minorities like Black and Latino gay men, bisexual, and other gay men who have sex with men. Um, the CDC states that if current diagnosis rates continue, one in six gay and bisexual men will be diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. For Latino and Black men who have sex with men, the rates are one in four and one in two respectively. Transgender people have also been especially uh, hit especially hard by the, by the epidemic despite comprising a similarly small percentage of the U.S. population. And while we need to say that better data is needed to understand the full impact of, of HIV on the transgender community, one international analysis found that transgender women in certain communities have 49 times the odds of living with HIV than the general population. And although HIV prevalence among transgender men is relatively low, the CDC suggests that some transgender men may still um, be, be at elevated risk for HIV um, acquisition. So in my experience and 26 years in this field, I have come to understand in my story that the biggest challenge that we face as a community and that continuously put us at risk is the homophobia and transphobia that we encounter in all sectors. Right now, there are more than 300 bills that attack our transgender youth and states that have made an effort to ban the word gay out of classrooms, um, pertaining to denying the existence of a diverse and beautiful community as the LGBTQIA community. And this is unacceptable. That we proclaim that we are a country of freedom and equal rights, but still allow fear and ignorance to nourish the homophobia and transphobia that directly attack us and kill us. As a young queer man, I remember the bullying and I remember the stones that were thrown at me. And I'm talking about physical stones, not metaphorical stones, because I was different. And it's because I was able to find refuge in an LGBT organization that I was able to find folks like me that supported me and accepted me for who I was. And that moment became life-changing. And so I have decided 
and I have dedicated my life and created safe spaces for LGBTQ folks to feel empowered and to seek the support that they need and deserve. The past two years have taught me that community engagement is crucial in the development of leadership and access to healthcare. To end the HIV epidemic in this country, we must ensure that there is equitable access to treatment and prevention strategy to those most vulnerable. That we create and sustain safe spaces to ensure that the community can seek care in affirming ways and that we continue to, hide, to highlight stories of encouragement, leadership, acceptance, and love. Finally, I do want to say that if you are an ally of the LGBTQ plus community, I invite you to check in on your LGBTQ folks, to offer support if needed, and to stand as an ally and advocate as we continue to take the challenge to defend our rights to access to care, stable housing, workforce development, and social acceptance. And if you are LGBTQ, please know that you're not alone, that there is a rich and diverse and accepting community standing beside you to reach the end of the HIV epidemic, the end of transphobia, and the end of homophobia. Thank you so much for listening to my story. Um, and now I have the pleasure to introduce a very beautiful and incredible woman, Jacqueline. The floor is yours. Man, your story hit me. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jacqueline Bickham, the Prevention Program Manager of the Louisiana Office of Public Health, the STD HIV Hepatitis Program. Uh, I know that's a mouthful. But we call ourselves SHIP for short. So storytelling is still and will always be important because it just doesn't just give an account of environments, situations, present and past. But it also uncovers, unfortunately, painful truths of the dehumanizing system that we are a part of. These dehumanizing systems that continue to plague and terrorize the spirit soul and well-being of humanity. We've learned and constantly learned that we must continue to engage our vulnerable communities in a more authentic and transparent manner. What does this mean? What does this look like? By allowing communities to have input into how they want to be treated and how they want to be provided for and how they want to be cared for. Notice I said input. This is far different than feedback. Input is shaping and controlling the narrative of their story. They are the author of their own story. Feedback is commenting on a story already written. Y'all, I live in Louisiana, which is considered the deep south, where we just had a law recently passed that gives me permission as a black woman on how I can comb my hair. Yeah, you don't believe me? House Bill 1083, let me read it to you. House Bill 1083 prohibits discrimination based on a person's natural, protective, or cultural hairstyle in education, employment, public accommodations, and housing. Many of us were gutted at the reverse of Roe v. Wade. Louisiana was one of 13 states which passed trigger laws to ban or severely restrict abortions once the Supreme Court overturned the ruling. Now, originally, a civil district court judge issued a temporary restraining order blocking the state ban. But then, Louisiana Health Department tells abortion clinics that the state abortion ban is in effect. And then for the second time, a judge temporarily blocked the state's trigger ban. And now abortions remain legal in Louisiana for now, after the Louisiana Supreme Court said it won't step in to, won't step in yet to overturn a New Orleans judge decision to temporarily stop the enforcement of state's 
abortion ban trigger law. So I'm like, what the? And we wonder how trauma enters into our psyche. How does this affect Keisha's story or Kendra's story or Shemaine? CDC data show that women with family incomes less than 100% the federal poverty level accounted for almost half of all abortion patients in 2014. Women in their 20s accounted for more than half of abortions. And Black women had the highest rate. So Keisha, Kendra, Shemaine, see, they're the ones that I represent, that I advocate for, that I defend. Unfortunately, their complete stories haven't been told yet. They, like many others, won't have the freedom to decide what is best for them. Here they are, yet battling another system that dehumanizes them. With the reverse of Roe v. Wade, what else could that lead to? Especially for my LGBTQ plus communities I serve and friends who have become family. Will their marriages still be honored under the law of the land? Just recently, Louisiana became the 18th state to bar trans girls and women from female school sports teams. See, these are examples of why storytelling is so important and must continue because storytelling can lead to advocacy and dissent. Hopefully our brave dissenters will have the strong iron constitution and the ability to do so without losing their positions, their jobs, their livelihoods, and their ability to occupy this space with their own humanity remaining intact. We must continue to fight against the assault on humanity Storytelling is about humanity. As gatekeepers, advocates, helpers, and storytellers, we must be true to the challenge, even when we tell the story when our voices quiver. In the words of President Barack Obama, we will also have to be willing to look squarely at the shortcomings of our own democracies and our systems. Only then will we be able to tell a better story of what democracy can be and must be in this rapidly changing world. Thank you. And now I will pass the mic to Vince, my fellow storyteller. I'm very honored to be part of this panel. Um, I'm a newbie. I wasn't on the original panel and I was asked, um, I actually did my first storytelling with um, Antigone, and that was in 1992. And we went on to train folks. But um, for me, um, Vince Chrysostomo, um, Director of Aging Services at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And um, I've been living with HIV since 1987, but I didn't find out till um, May of 1989. And, you know, at the time that I found out I was living in New York, um, I say I was a performer, but the truth is I took classes and waited tables. Um, I wasn't really a performer. Well, I don't know. I shouldn't get into that. It's not the point of the story. But anyway, um, there was also a rumor going around that Asians didn't get it. And so um, I remember going to the um, public health clinic for something. And after doing my intake was told that, oh, you need to test for HIV. And um, they sent me somewhere else. And you know, the thing about my doctor that morning was a woman who looked like my mother. She started asking questions. And, Are you gay? Do you do drugs? I'm like, oh my God, she sounds like my mother. And I got very, and I ended up testing just so she would shut up. And I thought, well, it's not gonna matter because I'm not gonna have it. You know, I was one of the gay men that became sexually inactive because of the scare tactics that were going around at the time. And so I said, you know, so I'll, there's no way. I've had sex with three people in the time leading up for this. So she ended that, <laughs> the duck, she goes like, um, you only get this from having sex with thousands and thousands of people. What do you have to say for yourself? I just looked there and said, I need to make up for lost time, you know? It's like, um, I had sex with three people. And if I knew then what I knew now, you know, I had been completely safe and I got it anyway. 
So anyway, um, I asked, you know, so how long do I have? And she said, well, I was 28. She said, you probably won't live to see 30. And you need to start getting your affairs in order. So um, that was May. So um, November, by November of 1990, I had left New York and I moved to San Francisco with my then partner. Um, his name was Jesse Solomon. We were one of the first 50 couples in San Francisco to sign up for domestic partnership. And um, by October 6, 1991, which was less than a year after we moved, I buried him. And I had to figure out what, what am I going to do with my life. Um, I ended up getting work. Um, I had been volunteering in HIV and AIDS since 1985, but I actually ended up getting a paid work with, uh, within the API community. And um, I was asked to share my story because we didn't have a lot of people who looked like me sharing their stories. And that's how I met Antigone. And so we took the Swedge program. And the first couple of times I told my story, I think people cried. And I thought, oh, that's, the, that's what we need to do for this to be effective. People need to cry. The third time I told my story, I was like, I can't keep doing this because this is just not going to work. But sh short, like, I think it was like my third or fourth story, like I had to, had to travel to Guam, which is where I'm from. And I was asked to do a public disclosure of World AIDS Day in 1992. And um, due to an earthquake and a, um, and a typhoon, I got there the day before we were supposed to do the big public disclosure. And when I got there, I was told, don't talk about being gay. Don't talk about your relationship with Jesse. Don't talk about your relationship with your mother who had disowned me. Don't talk about the church. Um, but please tell us about your life. And after we could comply with that, I realized, you know, well, actually it wasn't a week, but it was the longest 24 hours of my life when I finally took the stage the next night. It was like, I said, you know, this is where I'm from. If I can't be who I am here, where am I gonna go? Where can I be myself? And plus, I'm 31, or so I die by 30, so this is my chance to tell my truth. So I did. And then throughout the 90s and the 2000s, I worked with HIV positive speakers views across the globe. And at one point, I kind of thought this wasn't quite working because people started to say things like, well, try to incorporate things into people's stories that wasn't part of their lived experience. Also, at one point, I was told, it's like, you know, you make this sound so easy. Can you sound a little more tragic? And I was just like, um, no, I cannot sound a little more tragic. That was the one thing I did not want people to see me as was tragic. And so what I did was I supported my speakers by telling them, when in doubt, tell the truth, your truth. And so for me, you know, I went on, I've done work. You know, as part of UNAIDS, I've done a lot of policy work like Antigone. I've always felt like a, like some kind of a fraud at the table because I honestly didn't know what what was happening. And what was, when I was in the international world, I thought, you know what, I lived in San Francisco. I just need to do what we did, fight for what we fought. And some amazing things happened, you know, and people would say, who's that guy? You know, he looks like us, but he doesn't talk like us. He doesn't act like us. But I was really effective. <laughs> and it was like... You know, so um, anyway, November, actually March 2013, I had to come back to San Francisco because I could not get the care I needed overseas. It's something that people don't really think about. And I got this job direct, you know, working in um, long-term survivors, people of the age generation who had survived. And at first I thought, no, I've done my part. I don't need to do this anymore. But, you know, I needed a job. It was either that or go on general assistance. And lo and behold, eight years later, here I am, um, the director of aging services. Um, and then COVID, the second pandemic of my life came up and I just felt something die inside of me. It was the first time I ever felt unsafe in San Francisco. And I also thought, I can't do this again. I really cannot do this again. And um, then an incredible thing happened. I won a lottery to own a house, which was one of my childhood dreams. And um, I was, um, I was, um, my loan agent called me and he said, you know, Vince, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, I can't do this. I can't, there's a 
pandemic gap there. People are dying. I, you know, I might not have a job in June. And he just told me, it's like, if anything that your HIV experience should have taught you, it was that this will eventually pass. Where do you want to be when this is over? He said, when times like this happen, you need to make choices that are optimistic. You need optimism brings hope. And that's what we need right now. So where do you want to be? So I thought about this. So COVID became the reframing of my HIV story. And so this is what, you know, it's like, so when COVID does pass, where do I want to be? And what am I doing to get there? What has my past taught me? It's taught me speak up, you know, hold people accountable. So I tell men, cis men, you know, a woman shouldn't be the only one speaking up for the right. You should defend them and you shouldn't speak over them in meetings. For women, I said, tell us what you need so we can support you. You've helped us to this point. Let us know what we can do. To everybody, I say, support our trans and non-binary kids because if we support them, maybe their parents will support them. And to my BIPOC staff, I said, I tell them, tell your truths and do not ever apologize when you're speaking in a meeting for your truth and don't take responsibility for anybody's feelings because these are yours. So I'm going to end pretty soon, but just recently, two weeks ago, I was given a picture and the picture was handed to me and said, you're the only one alive in this picture. There were 30 people who were all my friends and I am the only one that was alive, that is alive. And they were all my API friends. And I just feel I have a responsibility to live a life, to tell the story that I want to tell and to figure out what it is I need to get, I need to get there. And also then what is the world I want to leave behind? And I keep working toward that every single day. So I get to turn this over to um, an esteemed colleague, Celeste, who I've not known very well, but has recently had big news in her life. So Celeste, you want to take it from here? Yes, thank you so much, um, Vince. I, it's been an honor for me and for all of us to, to sit here and hear and witness and share our stories. And um, I'm just so pleased to be here today. Um, I am Celeste Watkins Hayes. I'm a sociologist and scholar of public policy at the University of Michigan. I'm also the interim dean at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at U of M. And I take that responsibility very seriously in the context of this discussion, because here at the Ford School, we train future policy leaders. We train people who are passionate about the public good, who are passionate about the use of stories and other forms of data and experience to move the needle on some of our most pressing social issues. And we're training our students to do it with compassion and with care and with empathy. So it is my great honor to be here with you today, sitting in this seat also as uh, the interim dean of a school of public policy, because as we hear the stories today, we hear just how important public policy is. We hear about the power of storytelling to help us make the right decisions, to reduce fear, um, to develop leaders, um, and to use uh, the power of storytelling to help people, I love that term, make choices that are optimistic in their lives. So it's a pleasure for me to be here today. And what's clear from hearing from my fellow panelists is the power of storytelling as a way for people to connect and contribute, to paint vivid and profound pictures capturing the human condition, offering life lessons and encouraging others through our own experiences and the ways in which those things have, a, have been a long part of the cultural fabric of HIV community building. It's been the special sauce of HIV community building because we know that storytelling is healing, particularly as folks grapple with stigma and trauma and struggle. And I submit to you that storytelling is one of the most important resources for our learning. It's one of the most powerful tools for how we educate others. And I'm reminded of my conversation with HIV activist Rebecca Dennison, founder of World, who talked about the power of storytelling and stated, I remember the names of opportunistic infections because I remember the stories of the friends who had them. I remember the names of medications because I remember the stories of the people who took them. 
I don't remember them because I read medical articles. I remember them because of the stories. So when we hear stories, it impacts our consciousness and affects both our heads and our hearts, often making indelible impressions that have the potential to move us towards greater and meaningful action. Stories are a critical part of how we do our work. They're not the side projects. They're not the things that are the detours to get us to the quote unquote real work. They are the real work because they help us to understand what is needed and what is necessary. Storytelling is critical in the delivery of HIV services. We've learned through almost 40 years of HIV work that when health and social service providers, peer advocates are able to safely and carefully draw out people's stories, it improves the effectiveness of care. The viral suppression rate of 89.4% among clients of the National Ryan White HIV AIDS program is a story, yes, about the use of healthcare and economic supports to assist those living with HIV, but it's also evidence of the effective use of storytelling to improve policy outcomes and the overall well-being of people living with HIV and those deeply and most impacted by the epidemic. Storytelling is also an act of political resistance for those who are too often seen as expendable, who are subject to attack. Storytelling affirms our continued existence, our fierce insistence on holding space. HIV phobia, homophobia, transphobia, racism, sexism, ageism create the trauma that fuels HIV transmission and the people and people living with HIV falling out of care. Storytelling is the bomb that we can use. And haven't we experienced the bomb today as we have come to this panel with our own challenges and struggles and the ways in which we've heard each other's stories acting as a bomb to sell that trauma to at the individual level and then collectively through the subsequent actions that we all can take and will take. We're thankfully witnessing the durability of the Ryan White program, and it's important to celebrate that. But we are also seeing as we are experiencing and as we have heard on the panel today an assault on many issues tied to the communities most impacted by HIV. From the overturning of Roe v. Wade to the assaults on transgender healthcare, community voices have perhaps never been more vital. And sadly, our voices are operating at heightened risk. Sharing one's story is inherently a vulnerable act. Our stories can be exploited and misconstrued. They can be ignored. And in many ways, we are seeing these risks of telling our stories amplified in the present political moment. We're seeing the ways in which our current reproductive rights legislation in states like Texas effectively criminalize storytelling by disclosing decisions and challenges around whether and how to have children. Telling one story can put one at risk at, of prosecution and heightened surveillance. The attacks on more inclusive school curricula through policies like Florida's Don't Say Gay Law and the attacks on critical race theory and all the ways that that scholarship is being misconstrued and misrepresented are fundamentally efforts to silence the kind of storytelling that lead to deeper understanding and acceptance of diversity in all of its forms. We therefore must not only push back on legislation that has this kind of consequence, but create safe and affirming spaces in the meantime where individuals can discuss their lives without fear of persecution and prosecution. We must be savvy in how we make space for storytelling and helping providers safely create that space for clients is one of the most important things that Ryan that the Ryan White program can do right now. Given the heightened level of surveillance, scrutiny, stigma, and punishment that marginalized populations experience, often through interactions with systems, whether they be healthcare, criminal justice, government, et cetera, it's in fact a revolutionary act to build a movement, the HIV movement, and a service infrastructure around the notion of revealing. But that is what the HIV community has insisted upon doing to great effect, showing us all its importance. And people all over the world in the HIV community must be willing to continue to take this risk because we know that storytelling changes the atmosphere for the better. We gain new perspectives that improve the science. We are made better through a check and balance system on our language, our tone, and our assumptions that encourage us to do better and to be mindful and intentional as we discuss people's lives. 
we're held to a higher standard on the practicality of our ideas and the consequences of our decision making when we sit before those who have shared their stories with us. So how can we ensure that our stories and the stories that we tell have meaningful impact? I encourage you to continue to tell your stories to research, researchers and scholars like me who can connect what we hear to historical trends, sources of data, and theoretical constructs to move the science forward. We must continue to tell our stories to offer the deep context that policymakers need to understand the human toil of policies and procedures that too often live in the abstract. And we must continue to tell stories to shape cultural production so that what we see on film, on television, and on our personal handheld screens accurately depict our realities. And we must continue to tell stories that include fresh voices because those diagnosed with HIV in 2022 are going to have a different journey than those diagnosed in 1982. And we must be inclusive to continue to tell all those stories and attach specific demands, pushing for change in any policies and procedures that demoralize and disserve. Policymakers, healthcare and social service providers, industry leaders, scholars, and the general public need to hear our stories. As the listeners, we can't just invite people to come and share their truths just to check a box that we quote unquote engage the community. We must be prepared to deliver on the demands to the greatest and most feasible extent possible to provide resources to the people who share with us what they need. And we must be mindful of how asking a person to share their story can be re-traumatizing. So we must be prepared to be good stewards and supporters, to help hold the space, to walk with people in their sharing, even when our charge is to be quote unquote dispassionate professionals. Because storytelling, as we have seen today, in which I have been so honored to be a part of, changes the atmosphere. Thank you so, so much. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Valerie. Wow. Uh, thank you again to our storytellers. I, I truly appreciate your honesty and authenticity as you each spoke your truth. Um, I am truly moved, uh, and I am hopeful that others will be as inspired by your stories as I am. Uh, as a reminder, if you would like to earn continuing education credits for today's session, uh, please visit ryanwhite.cds.pesgce.com. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me directly, my contact information is on the slide. If you'd like to learn more about the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, please visit our new website at ryanwhite.hersa.gov. And finally, if you'd like to learn more about HRSA, please visit our website at hersa.gov or follow us on social media. We'll open it up to the live question and answer session sort shortly. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, and so before we begin our Q&A session, we just wanna, I just wanna say thank you so much to our presenters for sharing your stories. As you can see in the chat, you truly made an impact on those in the room with us today. So at this time, we, have, we will be posing questions from the attendees um, that we've uh, been sorting in the chat. Um, but definitely there's time to enter and submit a question for us using the chat feature. Um, you know, presenters are all coming up on camera for this Q&A um, and we will uh, continue to monitor the chat for new questions that are coming into us as we begin. So with that, I would like to turn it over to, to Valerie so that we can begin our Q&A session. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and again, thank you once again to our storytellers. I am just as moved as I was when we recorded this. Uh, it seems like a month, it was a month ago, but it seems like a lifetime ago. And I think most of you know what that feeling's been like over the past few years. Um, but my first question uh, is going to be for Vince and Antigone, um, who, who knew each other 30 years ago, give or take, uh, from their days of uh, HIV education in San Francisco. Uh, and, and you both mentioned um, kind of the, you know, the back and forth trauma of you reliving your stories, but I wanted to ask you both, and, and Vince, you mentioned it in your story, how has it been for you reliving yet another pandemic with, with COVID-19 and more recently uh, with monkeypox emerging? 
Uh, how has it been for you? And have there been any positives that you've been able to take from this time? Vince, you want to go first? No, why don't you go first? Oh, okay, okay. Um, thank you, Valerie. And I just also just want to take a moment to just thank everybody on this panel. Um, and thank you, Valerie, for being such a great moderator and all the wonderful um, words in the chat. Um, so I'm just uh, very honored to be with you all here today. I think for me, um, it was interesting when COVID first hit, I really reacted to it differently than from uh, folks in my life who did not have HIV. Cause like, I felt like I took it really seriously because I'd been through a, you know an epidemic before. Um, and I just remember being much more hyper aware very early on. Um, about it. And as th things continued, I, I really felt like the general population was experiencing what we experienced early on in the epidemic. And then, of course, I, I was re-experiencing that as well. But it was very strange to be sort of watching it and remembering at the same time the, um, you know, the judgment, the fear, the not having the information. Um, this is a different experience because uh, things were able to happen much more quickly with vaccines and treatment. But um, in the early days, I mean, for me, it really just re-brought up all, all of that, that feeling of the unknown um, and powerlessness. And, and, that, and I guess to tie this back to storytelling, that was the reason why I did start telling my story, because I felt so powerless. That was the one thing I had that I could do something about. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it, you know, brought up a lot of the different strategies and tools that I used early on, you know, in the HIV epidemic. So Vince, I'll hand it over to you. Um, for me, um, you know, it's interesting because I did the first part of my, um, actually, I don't know how interesting it is, but um, I did the first part of my story in San Francisco and working and doing pulsing and telling that story. And then when COVID happened, um, you know, I, I mentioned it in my story, but it's like, so what do we need to do differently this time? And I learned to speak up a lot more. Um, one of the things that I often cite is that I work with people here for like 25 years and some of them still can't say my last name. And so I correct them now, gently sometimes and sometimes not so gently. But um, I just I just think it's a time to learn from our past and, um, you know, to really try to figure out what does my community need? You know, I have an incredible community of long term survivors, and I do have to also acknowledge everybody else on the panel. It's so different to do this work in San Francisco than it is to do in other areas of the country. Um, but um, I was really glad that we were able to get, um, I think, the first 65 people we vaccinated for COVID at um in my organization were long-term survivors or their parents like we didn't plan to be the caretakers for our parents because we didn't think we were, we were going to be gone we have one member who has um he has two kids and he goes i had to get them vaccinated for covid like they're supposed to take care of me i'm 70 something years old and i'm taking care of them um but also to hear what people thought can you imagine they came up with a vaccination for hiv as quickly as how many of our friends might still be here. Um, for me, COVID also brought up all the things, I know there's been a lot of progress, but it also brought up all the things that were wrong in our country and things that people did blatantly, we would have been arrested for, and that didn't happen. Um, all the inequalities were race, gender, all that kind of stuff was reinforced. And so we can do this differently this time. And then when monkeypox came along, I thought, you know what, I am just not ready for this. And I thought I made a decision. I don't have to lead on this. There's just too much that's so related to my HIV experience. I don't need to, to learn about this publicly. I don't need to demonstrate that and how I deal with that publicly. So I have staff now that I can delegate to, and I've learned to delegate. Like I learned, I don't have to take on every battle. It's not up to me. Um, and the other thing that I've learned though, is that I'm not bitter. I mean, I think a lot of people in the chat to talk about some horrible experiences that we had. And I really, I learned through this, especially this last one, I was like, you know what, I'm not bitter and I still have more work left in me, more energy left in me to do the right thing. So thanks for that question. 
Thank you both. Uh, Celeste, question for you. Uh, you mentioned the importance of being able to share stories and certainly to hopefully impact policy. Um, but given the climate in many parts of this country, what are you telling people or how should people feel safe in protecting themselves to be able to tell the story, um, not only from a patient or client perspective, but from a provider perspective? We know that in some states, providers very much are at risk if they, if they share the information that their patients share with them. How can we help providers and patients and community members know when it's safe uh, to tell their stories so that we can continue to, to influence policy? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. And it, it's so important because you're, you're right, Valerie, we're living in a moment where um, telling one story can put one in a position where they can be persecuted and in some places prosecuted. And I think that we really need to think about a set of strategies in order to harness the power of storytelling, but pe keep people safe in the current environment that we're in. So one of the things that I think is really important is the power of the collective. The idea that um, it's gonna be really important and it's so, so critical for us to speak as collective voices and, and use the power of safety in numbers. So that if we're talking about a healthcare provider, a lone voice who is out there and visible is easily targeted, a collective voice that is organized, that represents an organization that is using the organizational name has the power to articulate a set of positions, but to do so in a more and a safer context. So part of this, I think, is a strategy question around how do we get the same messages out there, but to use different kinds of practices in order to do it. And we know that this has been really effective when you look at the history of HIV activism and the ways in which organizing, whether we're thinking about grassroots organizations and the power of the collective there, or uh, larger, more professionalized groups coming together to communicate a set of positions um, offers a, can offer a, a deeper level of safety. So that, that's a strategic thing. But at the same time, it's really important to get at the core and root of the issue. The idea that we are essentially legislating a set of policies that encourages silence. And everything that we know in public health suggests that that is absolutely the wrong way to go. So it's really important for us to talk to policymakers and to talk to other leaders about the consequences of those kinds of silences and to help people understand that has a ripple effect. It's not going to be just about silence around the choice of whether to have an abortion. It's going to be silence around a whole variety of, of sexual and reproductive behaviors and questions. It will morph into uh, silences around primary care. It will morph into silences around mental health because what we know is conversations around reproductive and sexual health are often the conduit to conversations around a whole host of health factors. Um, that conversation with that, that healthcare provider often opens up a whole portal for that provider to be able to network people to other kinds of needed services. And we are essentially legislating the cutting off of that very important information channel. And it's really important for us to help policymakers understand what those downstream effects will mean. It's morally problematic, it's socially problematic, but it's also economically problematic because we also know that the longer we go before we're able to treat an issue, the it's more expensive we know to have to treat than have to prevent, right? So what we're doing is basically setting ourselves up for a situation in which we will have to be in treatment mode in so many different instances where prevention really would have been a more economical upstream choice. So essentially, I think that it's really important for us to think about 
the strategic aspects of how do we operate on a day-to-day -day basis in this climate, but also how do we continue to communicate the likely downstream effects that we're beginning to see and will continue to see as a result of these kinds of policies. Thank you, Celeste. And, and noted, you're already starting to see uh, legislators who voted uh, for reproductive against reproductive rights now starting to see the consequences of those votes and it, it's definitely it, it's it's a scary time and uh I, I appreciate your input on that um kind of along those lines jackie in your experience what settings have been best for sharing hiv lived experience stories um thank you great question um in 2013 um I started collecting stories from our clients, basically in the form of case, their case managers or their linkage to care coordinators and telling the story of, okay, so why a certain population is not becoming virally suppressed? Or what is it about clients who maybe don't And even when we had our site visits out, um, I'm working prevention with our CDC site visits and partners, and they were asking about the data and the numbers and why this and why that, and why doesn't someone uh, become viral suppressed? So it was then that I needed to share the entire story. And what we call the in Louisiana or without health department of cause behind the cause, because the data doesn't tell the complete story. So it was then even in those types of settings where even in our site visits and I would at, we share stories of the people that were serving. So even in those, for instance, when we had a, loss, a, a site visit, let's say with a HRSA during a, that particular time in 2013, it was Capus where it was a collaboration HRSA uh, with CDC and HRSA and, and those of um, um, government organizations in which even in our site visits brought in our clients so that they can share their stories. So we also had to make sure that they understood that it's not linear why someone particularly their role to being virally suppressed. Now, when we look at the barriers that a client goes through, this is, this, you know, it's not that a client wants to wake up and say, hey, I don't want to feel good today, or I don't want to become well, or I don't want to be whole. There's a cause behind the cause. And that cause is, is that it's important that we tell the stories of our client, that the things that they're facing. So we decided that we making it part of our reporting to funders so that they can see the full story behind the story, the story behind the numbers. We making sure that even how we collect data, you know, we share the stories. And so these are the opportunities that we've been using the years in which most importantly is giving context to the data. That there is a reason we want to understand that is to hear the stories of the people who are mostly impacted. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and kind of going off of that, you mentioned that data doesn't tell the complete story. Mandra, what tools would you recommend to bring more stories into our data and presentations to make sure that funders, the government, legislators, the common person understands what this data means? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, and I think Resources and tools are not that that high level. I think we already have them. It's just how do we choose to choose to, to use them, right? Uh, for example, from, from a community-based organization perspective, every one of us, we have to do annual reports or trimester reports or monthly reports. And these are great venues to share stories, uh, not just reporting on, on the data or scope of services of this particular program, but allowing or maybe writing out a small paragraph on the executive summary or in comments about sharing a story about one of your clients or even not even on one of your clients, even your staff as well. Um, a lot of organizations do, do implement a peer model 
And that is powerful in itself because we use peers because of the stories that they bring and because of the connection that they bring to the community. So why not use those tools to share the stories? Um, also, because I've seen it in the chat as well, there are already interventions that are based on, on crafting stories. And so one of the interventions that I can think of that have been used for many, many years, um, that is part of the CDC compendium on effective interventions of work is community promise. So if you're an agency and you don't understand or you're thinking that this, this idea of sharing stories of your clients might be too difficult, you can go there and you can, and it, it is an intervention that will walk you through step by step into how to collect a story, how to develop a story. And this is not fiction stories. This is stories from the community, uh, which is the powerful and the beauty of this particular intervention. So there are resources out there that are free of cost. Uh, there's also capacity building out there that's free of cost that you can access that will, that will um, coach you and tell you how to, how to use that. Uh, but we have the tools already. We have the tools, we have the platforms. Um, also, organizations do annual reports, annual reports that they do, that they send out to their funders or to the community stakeholders. Another great platform to share a story, you know, and there's always some guidance. You, know, you want to make sure that the person that you're stating the story of um, gives approval or maybe use a, a, a nickname or something. Uh, but that's a great resource as well to share that story and through social media. Uh, I mean, I've seen it and we've done it when we have a client or a volunteer that's really committed, uh, that, that's really thankful, they don't mind sharing the story. And so you can uplift that story in your social media as well. So three resources that are not uh, expensive to an organization, they're free of cost and really accessible that can help bring your work and, and um, to different platforms, but also uplift the stories of the community that we serve. And then you brought up a good point about representation mattering, having community members with lived experiences, you know, not only sharing their stories, but working with other people. Like there, there's something to be said about having someone you can relate to appear. Maybe the story's not exactly the same, but it helps you know you're not alone. Uh, and with that being said, Antigone, what has been the most impactful or, or direct results of sharing your story that, it, you know, that you've been most proud of? Uh, you've been at Cursa for a number of years, been doing this work for a number of years. How has being on, on the other side, behind the curtain here with the federal government and being able to impact some of this work helped you? Yeah, thanks for that question, Valerie. Um, and uh, yes, uh, over 30 years, actually. When you say a number of years, I feel like I should. I was a young person when I started, and now I'm a little older um, and grateful to be there. But um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think for me, the, the you know, where I felt the most uh, affected by my experience of telling stories is the impact it's had on other people with HIV. So I'll just share like a quick story. Um, after I joined HRSA um, around 2015, we, we had a consultation uh, looking at young people in HIV. And it was, you know, I was like, okay, here we go again. Like I already I used to participate in these consultations, but um, we were doing this consultation and one of the panelists, a young man with HIV, he just kept looking at me and I was like, why, why is he looking at me? And, and one of the breaks, so we, I introduced myself and he said, are you Antigone from San Francisco? And I said, yes. And he was like, oh my God, when I was diagnosed, I was, look, I tried to find stories, you know, and he was diagnosed in the two, early 2000s. And he, you know, was like, I, couldn't find stories. And I found your book at like a secondhand store where one, one of my stories was in this book. And he was like, you were so angry. And I totally related <laughs> to it, you know, and, um, you know, here, here we were. Right. Um, but the other thing is I also learned in that experience, you know, we were talking about viral suppression in young people. And one of our questions was, you know, why, you know, why are young people struggling with viral suppression? And we had all these like poster boards up about charts with viral suppression. And he, and he said, you know, when I go to the doctor, all my doctor cares about when he sees me is, am I virally suppressed? He doesn't care about me. Like, I don't care about him. He does, but it was like, 
All you care about is my viral suppression. You don't care about me as a person. So here I had a learning moment, like, right, you know, like if we focus too much and don't include the voices of the people that are being impacted, um, you know, and that includes all different, all different people, um, then, you know, we need to hear, hear that as well, all different time, times on our path. So, you know, um, I, I always just feel so grateful to be able to hear from other people and continue to learn as well. Thanks, Valerie. And kind of along those lines, I mean, those of us who've been doing this work for a long time know that without your basic needs met, I mean, everything else kind of goes out the window. You don't know where you're going to sleep at night. You don't know if you're going to have enough money to pay the bills or don't even have bills to pay because you don't have a job. Uh, you know, we, we could preach about this till, till the cows come home. It just doesn't change things. But with that being said, Jackie, I mean, you mentioned some things that are going on in Louisiana, and, and I would be remiss in not mentioning that most of us are in. San Francisco, New York, you know, Michigan to some extent is, is somewhere in the middle there, uh, that are much more open and, and, and have policies that probably align more uh, with what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and we recorded our, our, our stories about a month ago and a lot was going on. So what, what's changed? Is there any new, good or bad? And with that, how are, how are you adapting and how are you trying to continue to support not only yourself because burnout is real um, when you're when it's coming at you from all ends and you're impacted about it and and how are you working to kind of what Celeste said trying to support as a community to kind of share and uplift the voices of those who clearly their needs aren't being met or heard for that matter yeah uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not easy it's hard um you know, when we did do the recording almost a month ago, you know, um, with the trigger law, with the abortion ban, you know, Louisiana, you know, we were able to continue with abortions. And then, then when you wake up the next morning, no, you can't have a, abortion is illegal in Louisiana. And then you wake up two days later, then no, now you can't have an abortion. And now, as of August 1st, you know, you know, abortion, you know, most of abortions are banned in Louisiana. So, you know, then we have that. And then we have, um, of course, Louisiana is a poor state. We've always have to help navigate our clients through poverty. Of course, we're not going to be able to solve poverty in our state, but just trying to navigate that and navigating through the systemic systems of racism. So is there an answer that I have, a, you know, this great answer that I can just tie up in this bow and how we are making strides? You know, sometimes it wears on you. You know, sometimes, you know, how we are the helpers, but sometimes the helper needs help to help other, you know, to help our community, our vulnerable community. So, you know, it's, it's difficult, um, it, it's very hard. And, um, but the thing about it is, is that we as a collective in our health department is, is that we have to lean on each other because there's a community that depends on us. And so, again, there's no easy answer for this. Um, we're just trying to operate in humanity as much as we can. And, um, so we are supporting the vulnerable people that depend on us. And, um, and in the meantime, we also have to take care of each other because we need to be in a better place or a good place mentally, spiritually, um, in order for us to take care of the people that is, you know, that we're entrusted. And we, and at the end of the day, when we seem like we fail, like one of the things I tell my, I tell my team, you know, we're not gonna always get it right. I said, but one thing that is for certain, always rely on your default button. And that default button is humanity. As long as we continue to operate in humanity, we'll get through it. You are, you are correct. Uh, I would like, we have got a few minutes left and I'm gonna put this uh, question out to all of our our uh, storytellers. Uh, Vince had mentioned about making optimistic choices. Uh, and, and I saw quite a few comments that people like that. So I'm, I'm gonna put it out to each of you. Plus, what does it mean to you to make optimistic 
optimistic choices. Whether that means, what's the thing, first thing that comes to your mind when you hear that? The first thing that comes to my mind is how much I like it. And I just put it in the chat. <laughs> um, because I think that it's very um, easy to focus on um, all of the challenges, whether we're talking about challenges that an individual faces, um, challenges that an institution is grappling with, or challenges at the larger societal level. It can, it can feel very um, dire. But when you're operating from a space of making optimistic choices, um, you're able to think about what's right in front of you that you can do that will affect a positive change? And then what's the next thing that you can do? And what's the next thing that you can do? And essentially, as you chip away, um, you're able to make serious and significant progress. And my, my worry is that if we operate from a place of pessimism, we will get um, stuck. Um, and unable to move things forward. Um, so for me, making optimistic choices, um, the way that I like to think about it is what can we do that's right in front of us? Because it feels more doable for me and more accessible. Um, and I do believe that those add up to major um, shifts over time. Thank you. Yeah, I I want to follow up what Celeste said because for me and, and when Ben said it, I, I loved it because it's it's one of the principles of transformational leadership, right? It's it's, it's the basis of, of transformational leadership. Seeing where, where people might see a barrier, you look for the opportunity. And maybe the result of that barrier may not be what you expected, but what did you learn through it? And how can you apply it to create a new opportunity? Um, so I, I definitely concur with what Celeste said, you know. We're living in times where it can it feels heavy for a lot of us that have been in the in the struggle and the fight in many fights because we're all in many fights. It can be consuming and and we can manifest burnout and we can just want to say oh I just want to retire to Hawaii and not think about anything else, uh, you know. But the fact of the matter is is that there's always opportunities for us to continue and to continue the movement and to continue the equal justice and to continue the movement for liberty for all of our fellow human beings in every, in, not only in this nation, but across the world. So, but that has to come with, you have to feed that somehow and, and looking and feeding that through optimistic the choice is the way to go. So thank you, Ben, for, for bringing that up. Jackie? I echo everything Dr. Celeste and um, definitely what Leandro said and also definitely what my fellow storytellers have said. And um, really to add, I, I really have no more to add to that. I think um, I just echo those sentiments. Antigone? Yeah, I mean, I think I would just add, again, I agree with everyone, um, but uh, for me, optimistic uh, choices, and it's so good, such good language, is about feeling that I can make a difference, um, you know, and I, I remember all the choices I've made have been, can I help at least one person? Will this help affect and change at least one person um, and try to make it easier for them than it was for me at the time? Um, and, uh, you know, and that's kind of guided me along the way. So for me, that that's what optimism is. But I also wanted to just quickly, there's a comment in the chat about people telling their stories in places that have a lot of stigma and don't react well to that. And I, I, somebody else asked about safety. And I think it's really important to acknowledge people do need to be safe and protected. And, you know, it's not always the right place for people to tell their stories. What is sometimes better uh, and my mother did this back in the day, is mothers telling the stories of their children or aunties or grandmothers. My mom used to go, you know, for AIDS Action Day and bring a picture of me to the senators and said, this is my daughter, you know, and they heard this message so much better from her than if I was in the room. So I think those, uh, uh, our allies speaking, can also make just as much change and can start that as well. So um, I'll end there. Thanks. Vince, since you're the one that brought it up, well, anything else you want to add on that? There's a few things. Um, 
first, remember discouragement is in the past. And um, it, it, my partner, Jesse, told me something. You know, when I first got into the whole healing thing, support groups, they taught us to speak from our experience. <laughs> so I would start everything. But in my experience, and he, one day he just told me, Vince, there is so much more to AIDS than your pathetic experience. You know, he just think in terms of possibility. You know, not about what you can't do. What can you do in the time that you have available to you? And I thought, wow, okay. And so that's what I do. Like, what's possible here? And, you know, the other thing has a performer, which I mentioned in my story also. It's like, know your audience. You don't have to tell them everything. And you want to make sure, because if you fall apart while telling your story and you can't recover from it, that's what they remember. And also to remember that you have no control over what someone resonates with your story. So just think in terms of possibility. What is your purpose for being there? Have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And when it's time, call it a day. So. And you've literally brought us today. It is just about time to call it a day. That is uh, an absolute uh, perfect ending. Uh, Amy's going to bring us back home, but I would just like to make one last uh, shout out to FIRST's Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. Uh, we have 10 regional offices. Uh, for those of you who would like to, you know, run, run, ask questions, any questions, technical assistance, you just need some support from HRSA. There is no wrong door with HRSA IEA. Uh, I'm going to put my email in the chat again. Uh, even if you are not in my region, Region 9, I will connect you with the right folks. Um, but again, thank you so much to our storytellers. Uh, this has been such a wonderful uh, experience working with you again. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back to my friend Amy from HAB to bring it home. Great. Thanks so much, Valerie. I just want to take a moment to say thank you to Celeste, Leandro, Jackie, Vincent, Antigone, and the official moderator, Valerie, for just an amazing presentation today and such a great panel discussion. Great to have you all together again and Vince for joining the crew. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to everyone who stayed for this hour and a half and participated today as part of the HIV AIDS Bureau effort to provide you with timely topics and interesting speakers. We really would appreciate you filling out the session evaluation at the end of the session. Um, if you're seeking continuing education credits, please complete the additional value for the credits. Um, to access the evaluations, please return to the session page within the platform and click on the blue evaluation links. Again, thanks so much for everyone for joining for today's panel for Pam and Pamela for helping with the, the chat. Um, that is a wrap for today's session. Uh, please enjoy your break and then please join us again at 1.30 for today's plenary presentation on, you guessed it, community. So have a great afternoon, have a great lunch. <laughs>